welcome to York Festival Ideas and our session this evening on what climate change, uh, what climate justice means and why we should care. My name is Richard Friend. I'm a senior lecturer in human geography in the Environment and Geography Department at the University of York. And I'm also the research champion for risk, evidence and decision making. Okay, great. So let me uh, introduce this evening's speaker. Elizabeth Cripps is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and the author of Climate Change and the Moral Agent, and also of What Climate Justice Means and Why We Should Care, which will form the basis of today's uh, talk. Elizabeth is a former journalist turned moral philosopher with a focus on climate ethics and justice. Elizabeth has previously worked for the Financial Times Group and has written for The Guardian and The Herald. So please allow me to hand over to Elizabeth to share her findings with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, everyone, um, and thank you, Richard, for chairing. So I would like to begin, as I begin in the book, by asking you to imagine that you're in a situation that's very different from the one you're in now, sitting, I expect, in your home or office, watching a computer screen. Imagine that you live in a bamboo house, in a village which is perched very precariously between the jungle and the sea and there's been a cyclone. So the water in your village is now full of salt. It's undrinkable. Even worse, there was a barricade to protect your community from the more dangerous animals in the jungle, but that's been destroyed by the cyclone too. As a result, you know that a tiger could get to you and your family in five minutes. That's all it would take at any time. So for a moment, really try to imagine how it would feel to be in that situation. Imagine how it would feel for the people you love to be in that kind of constant danger. Then step back, be yourselves again, but be yourselves in relation to the people who are in situations like that. Ask yourself, what do I owe them? Do I owe them anything? And that's the starting point for this book because there are countless people who are in situations that are just as bad as that. And that situation itself wasn't, wasn't something I made up. That was the, the exact situations that um, citizens um, of Bangladesh, the inhabitants of um, a small village on, on the shores of Bangladesh were in after Cyclone Bulbul. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is talk you through, if you like, the, two, the sort of key takeaways of my book, what climate justice means and why we should care. But first, I want to explain why I've waded into this debate at all as a moral philosopher. There's a huge amount that's written out there on climate change. You might very well be wondering, well, why should we listen? Why should we be interested in this particular perspective? And the reason I think this matters is because climate change isn't just a scientific, a political or economic challenge, although of course it is all of those things. What often gets forgotten, I think, is that any climate policy decision is making assumptions. When the government decides to act, or more often in our government's case, not to act on climate change, it's making assumptions about what takes priority, about who to protect, and if we don't expose those assumptions, if we don't hold them up against some core moral values that we can all agree on, what happens? It's not that we magically have some value-free way of making decisions. Instead, what happens, what actually happens in practice, is that what counts as values, the things that are taken as important in making those decisions, are just the interests of those who happen to have the economic or political power. So I think this kind of moral scrutiny is completely essential if we're really going to understand what's going on with climate change and also what we as individuals can do about it. So let's turn that moral lens on what's happening now. So the first thing I want to say is that this should not be controversial. It's become this incredibly politically polarised debate. So it's almost become about political party affiliation, especially in the States, but actually even here as well. 
But really, climate justice, at its most fundamental, is just about basic morality. So this is about human beings now and in the future. And it's about whether they can lead decent rather than terrible lives. It's about them not drowning, not starving, not dying of malaria. So we can start, and again I do this in the book, we can start with a couple of really basic moral ideas. One of them is this, it's wrong to do serious harm to other people. So it's wrong to drown somebody, it's wrong to burn their house down or to tear their children from them. If we put this another way, it's wrong to violate basic rights. And I think whatever your political affiliation, you're not seriously going to deny that. That's something on which pretty much everyone can agree. Another moral principle that we could start with says, well, it's wrong not to protect other people from serious harm if you can do that comparatively easily. So if you can pull a child back from a cliff top or you can drag somebody who's drowning from the water, you do it. You just do it, even if it would make you late for work or if it would ruin your new shoes. And you just do it because that it seems pretty much a, a prerequisite for recognizing yourself and them as human beings, as moral agents at all. And again, I think this is something that, that very many philosophers and probably most people would agree on. But then we think about what climate change is doing and who is causing it. So it's really easy when it comes to climate change just to get lost in the numbers. And the numbers, to be honest, are terrifying. So what I want to do instead now is start with a few individual true stories. So the first one is the elderly couple in Yorkshire whose bungalow was destroyed by floods after Storm Georges. And this bungalow was not only their home, it was home to three generations of their family. Or we could think about one of the children in this UNICEF report that's pictured here. So this um, child was 11 years old when UNICEF interviewed him, and he was in mourning for his best friend, who had been eight, who had drowned in floods, again exacerbated, made worse by climate change. That was in Bangladesh. Or we could think about a five-year-old girl called Badro in Afghanistan. So her parents were forced from their home because of drought and conflict, again exacerbated by climate change. They had no money, their livelihood had been destroyed. They were completely desperate. So what they ended up doing was engaging Badro to marry a man who was 30 years older than her. Now these are real people, they're real tragedies. And I know these are horrible stories. I don't like telling them and I don't suppose you like listening to them. But the reason that I'm telling them and that I tell stories like this in the book is because it helps us to realize that this is actually what's going on. This is how far the impacts of climate change stretch. So when we talk about things like climate change making extreme weather worse and more likely, when we talk about climate change as destroying livelihoods, these are the kind of real life tragedies that we're talking about. And of course, this is exactly what climate change does and it's predicted to get worse. And, which is the other important factor in making clear what an injustice this is, climate change is caused by humans. So there's, there's no real doubt about that either. Even back in 2009, 97% of climate scientists agreed on this. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been producing reports on this for 30 years now, and every year the reports are clearer and more unequivocal. They're, make, they're, they're very clear that this is caused by human beings and it's happening. So the only reason that there is doubt in the public or political debate, and this is something I talk about in the book as well, is that that doubt has been carefully manufactured. It's a product. It's a, a very lucrative product produced by people who have vested interests in the fossil fuel industry. And when I was researching for the book, I looked at some of the social scientific evidence on this. And to be honest, it's as compelling and it's almost as terrifying as the science is on climate change. So this, this goes as far as, as obviously, 
influencing scientists, influencing politicians, but also even trying to influence children. So um, climate denial organizations will send out books to thousands of schools in the US. Um, the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board funds educational materials, um, including a set of, of stories about this character called, called Petro Pete, who whose life is completely amazing because of all the petroleum products that he's able to enjoy. And um, one night he has this terrible dream that all the petroleum products are taken away and his life is, is made completely terrible. I mean, this, I'm really not making this up. These, this is the, the extent to which climate denial is this incredibly organized, pervasive um, machine. So climate change is happening. Humans or some humans, I'll come to that in a moment, are causing it and it's terrible. But that's not all. Because, and this is the second key point that I, that I make in the book, climate change isn't hurting people at random. So Vanessa Nakate, the Ugandan climate activist, wrote an article a few years ago for The Independent. And she said, um, two degrees C is a death sentence for countries like mine. And she's completely right. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to be honest, their reports make incredibly grim reading wherever you are in the world, but they are starkest of all for the global south. And actually climate change is already reality in, in much of Africa, much of Asia. They've actually been having to, to live with it and to try and adapt to it for decades now. And this is also even this also applies even within countries that climate change doesn't hit everyone equally. So if you think about um, a relatively rich country like the UK or the US, it tends to be poorer communities, often indigenous communities, communities of color, black communities who suffer more, who are more vulnerable to the harms done by climate change. And it's often women. Women tend to be worse harmed than men by climate change. That's very well documented now. And what's more, these harms are what philosophers call intersectional. So we can't fully understand them just by talking in these kind of big, um, big categories, um, because actually people who are in overlapping categories can be can be hurt disproportionately. And some efforts to kind of make make people better off won't necessarily help them. So women of color, for example, tend to be most hit by many injustices, but including climate change and efforts to redress the injustices that focus on, um, for example, um, black men or white women won't necessarily help them. So this is, is a race injustice, it's a gender injustice, and it's what we call an intersectional injustice. So um, just to give a couple of examples of this, um, after the 2004 tsunami, Oxfam surveyed some villages in Indonesia, and they found consistently that women and girls were more likely um, to have died in the tsunami than men. And in fact, um, in one village, the ratio was four to one. So four women um, or four females had died to, to every male. Or we could think about um, Hurricane Katrina. So clearly, this was a huge tragedy. It was it's the sort of thing that's called a natural disaster, but of course it can no longer be called an entirely natural disaster because these are exactly the kind of extreme weather events that climate change makes more frequent or makes worse. And it didn't affect everyone in equally. So um, a few years um, after, um, after the hurricane, a um, social scientist, Harvard social scientist called Patrick Sharkey decided to, to do some sums. And he was comparing the proportions of the population who had gone missing or who had died in Hurricane Katrina with the proportion that had been that were black Americans. And he found consistently that black Americans were disproportionately likely to have been killed or to have gone missing. So um, for example, overall 81, I'm sorry, 84% of people who were still missing by 2007 were black compared with 68% of the overall population of New Orleans beforehand. Um, black Americans made up 51% of New Orleans elderly population, but there were 58% of the elderly who died were black. Um, for the non-elderly population, the figures were 70% and 82%. 
And this isn't coincidence. So this is because it tended to be that black communities were living in more precarious areas. They had less resources, less money, either to protect themselves or to be able to escape to, to safer areas. And of course, we don't need to look very far in a state like Louisiana to find the explanation for that. We have a state which was dominated firstly by slavery, then by the Jim Crow laws that enforced segregation. And the legacy of that is that the black community in, New Lu in Louisiana is already worse off, is already more vulnerable. And then something like Hurricane Katrina comes in and exacerbates those existing inequalities so that the people who are already worse off tend to be hit hardest. And it tends to be those who are worst impacted by climate change. This is another reason why this is just such a clear cut injustice. Um, those who are worst impacted also tend to be the ones who've done least to cause it. So figures from, um, again, from Oxfam, but also they were, um, I worked in combination with the Stockholm Environment Institute on these ones, um, found that the richest 10% of people in the world produced 52% of greenhouse gas emissions between 1990 and 2015. The richest 1% of people in the world produced more greenhouse gas emissions than the poorest half of the world's population. And it tends to be those who are worst off, who are worst hit by climate change, who have the least voice, the, the least say in global decision making. And Vanessa Nakate, the Ugandan activist, is again um, a very poignant example of this. So um, I'm sure several of you will remember this um, from a few years ago. Um, a photo was taken, the bottom photo on the slide was taken at the Davos Economic Forum. Um, the picture was of Vanessa and a number of um, other young climate activists. The news agency then circulated the top photo. They had cropped Vanessa from the photo. Now, the news agency itself um, said afterwards that this was an honest mistake. But um, Vanessa's experience was unfortunately incredibly representative of the way in which the voices of women and particularly women of colour are treated in the global debate around climate change. So the other thing that I don't think we can, we, that we need to understand if we're going to grasp what climate injustice is really about is that this isn't only about human beings. So climate change also destroys non-humans. So the little um, mouse-like um, creature on the left on the slide there is, or rather was, called the um, Bramble Case Melomis. It was the first mammal to go extinct because of climate change. According to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, if we have two degrees C of warming, then a third of the species in the Amazon will be at risk of extinction ecosystems are being destroyed by climate change. And of course, this doesn't happen without terrible suffering to individuals. So the picture um, on the right will be a reminder, I'm sure, to everybody of the kind of horrific images that we saw coming out of Australia after the bushfires, the huge suffering that non-human animals um, were, were experiencing on, on a massive scale. And this matters. So as a moral philosopher, I'm quite happy to say this, this seems pretty clear cut. It matters that we're doing this kind of harm to non-humans. It matters because in many ways, non-human animals are like us and are entitled to consideration as well. So their lives can go well or badly. They have interests is another way we put it. It's not just, it's not just that they can feel pain, although they can, but actually the more new, recent neuroscience shows that actually many um, mammals and some non-mammals have these incredibly sophisticated capacities for really complex lives. They can be affectionately social. They can find fulfilment, for example, in parenthood. When it comes to species and systems, although 
they don't have individual lives in the same way, they still have a kind of complex and beautiful integrity. And um, many philosophers think that actually species and systems also matter in their own right and should be protected in their own right. So it's certainly, I think, a moral outrage that climate change is doing this to the non-human world. It's arguably an injustice. But even if, even if you don't think that, even if you just think, well, non-humans don't matter morally, you couldn't afford to set this aside. We can't just ignore what we're doing to non-humans because ultimately, as humans, we also depend on these, these very systems, these very complex um, biodiverse organisations which are, which are at stake. So we are essentially destroying the world, the systems which maintain the planet in a state that it's possible for us and for our children and for future generations to live in. And actually, if we think about the sort of different injustices here, um, a number of, of thinkers, including eco-feminists, say, well, look, actually, these are interlinked. So if you think about the kind of patterns of oppression, which have meant that, that women and people of colour for many years have been exploited and almost made into commodities, the same, the same patterns are also explaining the way in which the non-human world has been commodified and oppressed. So that's climate injustice. That's what I try to show in the first half of the book. This is what it looks like. And essentially, we are looking in a mirror when we talk about this. But what does climate justice mean? Where do we go from here? So if we could wave a magic wand tomorrow and get global leaders to agree on a way forward that would actually be a just response to climate change, what would it look like? Well, the first thing to say, fairly obviously, is that it would involve immediate concerted effort to stop global warming from going above 1.5 degrees C. That's the absolute basic necessity for any kind of, of justice for future generations. But even that is still going to leave many parts of the world and many people very vulnerable to climate change. So climate justice also means adaptation so that people, all people are able to lead decent human lives despite the kind of climate, uh, climate change or global warming that we're already committed to. And it requires compensation for those cases where that comes too late. So um, if we think, for example, about um, small island states which are, are effectively already condemned to disappear, then what their citizens would be owed would be as much compensation as possible, but it can never fully make up for what they would have lost. So those are the, the sort of necessities for climate justice. But then, of course, a key question is, well, who decides exactly how we do this? And who is going to pay for it? So in terms of who should, who should bear the cost of this, who should pick up the tab? A lot of um, philosophers, thinkers have um, argued about this for a long time. And actually, the, um, although there are disagreements around, around the margins, when you look at kind of serious peer-reviewed ethical work at this, on this, there is a broad consensus, as clear, I think, is the consensus in climate science that this is happening and it's caused by humans. It should be rich, high polluting agents, whether we're talking states, individuals or corporations who are picking up the tabs here. And we can, we, we can get to this conclusion broadly, whichever of the two basic moral ideas I started with, we go with. So if we talk about the fact that it's, it's wrong to harm, then clearly the polluter should be paying here. If we start with the idea that we should protect the vulnerable if we easily can, that we should be working to protect human rights, then it should be richer states who pick up the tab here. Or we could go with another um, moral idea, which actually is, I think, very broadly shared and, and almost as uncontroversial, and that's the idea of fairness. And that says, well, look, people who are living in, in states like ours, in the UK, we're living the kind of lives that we do because of centuries of industrialization. 
we are reaping the benefits of exactly the same processes which have meant that many other people already now and in future generations are going to suffer harms. And now we know this, if we continue to benefit without being prepared to bear the costs of tackling climate change, then essentially we're free riding on their suffering. We're not doing our fair share, we're not paying our way. So a sort of more um, nuanced version, um, which brings all these ideas together, which I talk about in the book, is developed by the philosopher Simon Caney. And essentially that says, well, look, when we're talking about how we distribute these costs, a fair way to distribute these costs globally, polluters would pay so long as they're not too poor. The rich should pay, especially if they're rich on the back of past injustice. And the most vulnerable shouldn't be made to pay. But justice is about more than who gets what. It's also about who has a say in the decisions that most affect them. So it's also about participation. And crucially, in this case, it's about ensuring that the people who are most vulnerable actually get a seat at the global decision making table or the national decision making table. And because these are global decisions, they're intergenerational decisions, they're even arguably interspecies decisions, this means that, that, that true participatory justice would mean representing, even though they can't actually obviously sit at the table, representing future generations in decision making in some formal way, um, representing other species as well, potentially. And this also means kind of systematic change because often when we're talking about um, the past injustices that climate change is making worse, we're not just talking about people not having had a political say, we're talking about whole communities essentially being treated as though they don't exist at all. So we need kind of systematic change to make those communities visible and to give them a voice at the decision making table. Now, of course, in practice, unfortunately, we're nowhere near this. This isn't happening. So the IPCC specifies the goal of 1.5 degrees. Actually, for many parts of Africa, for example, that would still be too high. But any more than that is going to be disastrous. But then after the Glasgow Conference of Parties in November, a group called Climate Action Tracker essentially um, looked at all the pledges that, that states had made and compared those with what was actually needed to get 1.5 degrees C. And what they found was that if all states stuck to all the long and short term targets for net zero that they had announced, even not only the ones that they'd committed to, but everything that they'd, they'd said announced that they would do, that would keep global warming to 1.8 degrees C. When they looked more narrowly at the nationally determined contributions that states had made, so the commitments that states had made through the Paris Agreement framework to cut their, their emissions by um, 2030, they found that those would keep global warming down to 2.4 degrees. Then they looked at states' actual policies and found that they were putting us on track for 2.7 degrees, which is frankly terrifying terrain. So we're already a really long way short of basic justice, of climate justice, even before we start looking at other things like the fact that actually there's been this massive failure to provide finance for climate adaptation or for compensation, or without even looking at the sort of difference between transparent, representative decision making, the kind of decision making that we need for participatory justice, and the COP process, because actually what goes on at the COPs is lots of um, diplomatic negotiations which take place behind closed doors. It tends to be, broadly speaking, the richer states, the ones who can afford to bring along lots of negotiators who get the key decisions made in their favours. So we're in a situation in the real world we are, where we are a long way from climate justice. And that's because some big players, governments and often corporations, big corporations like fossil fuel giants, are refusing to do what they should. So um, in the philosophical terms, we call them non-compliers. 
So that leaves everyone else choosing between lesser evils, essentially, trying to find ways of moving forward closer towards climate justice despite this, to find ways of persuading or compelling these players to change their minds and play their part. So what do we do when we're in this situation, what philosophers call non-ideal justice, where we know that there isn't full compliance, people aren't all going to do what they should, we are making these trade-offs, Perhaps it might seem tempting to say, well, look, in this point, we just have to stop talking about all these great moral ideas and just think about what's politically expedient. And actually, I think that's a dangerous response. I think when we're in the world of making trade-offs and having to choose lesser evils, it's still crucial, it's possibly more crucial than ever, to hang on to some basic moral ideas, some kind of lines that we just should never cross. For example, we must protect basic human rights. It's crucial that there is a voice for the most vulnerable in decision making. So that's where we all are. But that still leaves each of us with a question, probably the question that, that many of you are wondering, that is certainly um, a key question for me in thinking about this. And that is, well, what do I do? Because we might well be thinking, well, can I do anything? I'm, I'm relatively powerless. How can, I, how can I actually make any difference at all? I think it's a mistake to think that we're powerless, that we can't do anything as individuals. The first thing to say is, going back to the sort of moral ideas that we started with, this is a moral crisis. It's a moral emergency, and we are all moral agents. We need to make the effort to protect other people from climate change if we can, because climate change will be terrible for them. And it's worth remembering, I think, that we're also talking here about our own children and grandchildren. So this is about our capacity to prevent great harm to others, but it's also about being complicit in that harm ourselves. So we are voters. Many of us here are voters. We're shareholders. Anyone who has a pension fund is a shareholder. And actually, we should probably feel very uncomfortable indeed about what those pension funds invest in. We're consumers. So a lot of us drive, a lot of people fly or eat meat, for example. And of course, it's not your fault or my fault individually that this is, that this is happening. I'm not suggesting that. The real villains here are the governments and fossil fuel companies who are actively trying to hold back progress on climate change. So I'm not trying to make anybody listening to me feel guilty. But this is happening because of the way we live together, the way, that we, the way of life that we're all part of is causing these harms or making them worse. And I do think that once we know that, that should perhaps make us feel ashamed and it should, at any rate, give us a serious motive to do something. Now, we can't individually save the lives that are being impacted by climate change. We can't stop climate change individually, but we can do a huge amount by acting together. So the short answer to my what can I do question that I put in the book is, well, we should all be climate activists. Now, it's really tempting, I think, um, at this point to think, well, look, if I should do something, I'm just going to focus on what I can most easily control. So it's tempting to retreat into that and think, well, I'll just focus on my own carbon footprint. And actually, I think that is an important part of what we can do, so long as we're actually focusing on those changes that really do um, have a significant, make a big dent in, in emissions. So thinking about... Um, not driving or not flying or, or cutting down animal products. That is a core part, I think, of what we should do. And I talk more about why in the book, but it's only a part. Ultimately, this has to be about what we can achieve together for many reasons, not least that it's actually really hard for individuals to make some of these changes, especially um, for those individuals who are already worse off, to make many of these changes on their own if they don't have the social infrastructure to make it possible. So, for example, it's all very well to say you should get the train if train tickets are massively more expensive than driving. 
So ultimately what I'm advocating is activism in a very broad sense, which um, includes um, making changes to your own life as part of kind of social movements towards um, a different way of living, a, a greener way of living. But it also and crucially involves everything from going on marches to petitioning your bank or pension fund to change what they're investing, to write to your MP, to using your vote carefully, possibly also to civil disobedience. Now, the last thing um, I want to say before I, I hear and, and respond to your questions is this. I'm not a pessimist. I mean, what I talk about in the book is terrifying, and I wrote it because I do think it is terrifying and because it is a moral crisis, and that easily and too often gets forgotten. But I do think there is still room for hope here. There's room for hope because actually a lot of the things that we would do in tackling climate change would also make our lives and the way we live better for us in all sorts of other ways, often make us healthier psychologically and physically. But there's hope because climate change can still be tackled. We can still avert this. But it mustn't be, I think, a kind of passive hope. So this can't be the kind of hope that um, middle-aged people like me have, if they sit back in their chair and look at the youth strikers and say, oh, aren't they amazing, they give me hope. Because it's not their job to give us hope. In fact, it's another instance of this, of this injustice that we're doing, that we've put young people, school kids, in this position where they're essentially having to try and take on politicians who aren't doing those jobs, their jobs properly. What we should be thinking instead is how we can earn hope, both for future generations, for our children, for the, those who are already being impacted by climate change, and for ourselves. And that's what um, I try to push is the message of my book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. That's, that's wonderful. I think uh, I have to say uh, I've read the book. I very much, well, enjoy perhaps is not the right <laughs> word, it's, it's, very, it's very rich, it draws very well on a rich tradition of moral philosophy. Uh, it's, it's very uh, detailed, but uh, I think as you ended your talk, it does give us a, a sense of hope as well, which is quite uh, amazing given the enormity of the challenges that we face. Um, okay, I just gonna open up the questions. We've got a, a nice, range of questions that have already come in and please I would encourage you to uh, keep adding to the questions. Um, I'm going to start with the first two which uh, are kind of connected around issues of uh, the sort of gender and race dimensions of how climate impacts are, are created and distributed. So maybe we could take the first two together and I'll read uh, the first one out. So why is it that women are more affected by climate change than men? Uh, and then the second question uh, sort of goes on, on a little bit from this point. Would there be reasons other than gender and race for the higher fatality of black women? And are there any studies uh, to look deeper into the phenomenon? Phenom phenomenon? Um, great question. So the reason, that women are more impacted. There are there are a huge sort of instance of, of individual reasons, but they basically come down to the way in which um, women. So they, they're not they're not biological differences, right? So this isn't this isn't to do with some idea that women are, are naturally weaker and therefore more vulnerable to climate change. This is because of of the position that societies put women in. So um, for a couple of examples, and these are from um, from sort of UN um, collection of, of stories and, and evidence that, that they put together. Um, but for example, um, women in um, in some parts of the world are vulnerable, more vulnerable to domestic violence because of climate change. So as as things get worse, as crops um, get damaged as as the the sort of that comes into conflict between the crops which are grown for sale and the crops which are grown for family use women can essentially find themselves coming into conflict with the men in their lives because um because there is this sort of tension over over what to do how to use the 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 crops that can can still be grown 
or um, another example which is just like incredibly basic but if women if girls aren't taught to swim which they aren't in in some in some societies then they are more likely to die in floods or if if if, if women's clothing um, make it more difficult for them to move then again they're more likely to die in floods so there are all sorts of specific reasons but ultimately they come down to to existing um, gender divides within um, within different societies and so the um, the sort of second question on um, the impact on on black women so the idea of intersectionality um, as you you might well know that I'm drawing on here is 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 developed by um, a legal scholar called Kimberly Crenshaw um, there have been a lot of um, there's been a lot of work by um, feminists looking at the gendered impact of climate change um, including in politics also in in your field of, of geography Richard as, as you'll know um, so some people who've looked on this um, for example um, the work of Giovanna de Chiro or Sherilyn McGregor um, um, Farana Sultana who's also done a lot of work looking at race and gender um, in climate justice um, which has been really important the other thing I mean I think it's worth saying is that that's the kind of the the sort of the key um, example of intersectionality now which which comes out but actually there are huge other there are a number of other ways in which climate change is, is exacerbating existing social injustices so um, for example I looked at a study from um, well a, a story in um, in Grist magazine which was talking um, about the um, transgender community in Jamaica and how essentially because they were socially excluded they were then much more vulnerable to, to climate change and to extreme weather than, than they would have been otherwise. So there's just all sorts of ways in which climate change is, is hitting those people who are already vulnerable for certain various reasons worst. Thanks. Yes, there is a question about if there are, I think this must relate to Katrina, if there are other reasons, reasons beyond gender and race that explain the high fatality of black women. And I guess that's down to sort of issues of uh, wealth, poverty, class. Yes, exactly. That I mean, so so these the, the, so gender and race are just two of the many different. I mean, they call them social categories. In in is one way of putting it, which which can intersect. So yes, class is another one of them. Ability or disability is another huge one. So so the disabled are are more vulnerable as well. So uh, we have two uh, very interesting and kind of connected questions. Maybe we can take them together. So one about capitalism and one about colonialism. Okay. So the first one is in, in this context of climate injustice and justice, do you think that capitalism in any form is morally acceptable? And I think kind of related to the, well, kind of related is uh, an, another question. Has there ever been any successful instances of climate reparations to correct damage done by colonialism? That second one is a very good question, and I'm going to admit that I don't know the answer, but I would point you again to the work of um, Farana Sultana, who might well um, be able to, um, that there might well be um, some instances there. I am not aware of any, but that doesn't mean there aren't. Um, so um, the first question, capitalism, oh, I don't know. I mean, <sighs> so in order to show that this is a fundamental injustice, you don't have to be a socialist. You don't even need to think that justice means that we all need to be made equal in terms of opportunity, because actually all you need to do is recognize that basic rights are at stake. So even somebody who is you know, right wing and very committed to capitalism should be able to recognize that this is a fundamental injustice. Um, having said that, big inequalities are clearly a huge problem because um, as soon as you have one group of people who is massively better off than others who has a huge share of the power then it te has tended to be the case that 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 in dis political decisions were made in the interests of that group and that the interests of the more vulnerable um, will be at stake. And we've seen that with the sort of huge power and money developed by the fossil fuel industry. For example, we see that with the Oxfam figures that show how, how it is the world's richest, which are disproportionately causing climate change. So another um, 
another statistic which I hope I'm remembering right, but it's something along the lines of if the if the all the rest of the world, so the rest of the ninety percent of the world, um, stopped producing greenhouse gases tomorrow, the um, the richest ten percent of people in the world would still cause us to blow the carbon budget in just a few years beyond what we would have done anyway. So so clearly the current massively unequal way in which we live is hugely exacerbating climate change. Um, so I wanted to write the book to I wanted to make it clear that this is a huge problem, whatever your political perspective. I think we need to find a way of tackling it and politically, I mean, we're coming back to this sort of, you know, what's what's politically practical. Part of me says I really hope it can be done within capitalism because it needs to be done so quickly, but I, I honestly don't know. I, I think this would be a, a great topic for another session. It really uh, would be, I'm yes. i uh, glib here, but uh, I think, you know, this whole question about the nature of capital, of capitalism, if there is something inherent in capitalism that has cr created or is exacerbating the situation we're in. And of course, as Naomi Klein's book, uh, This Changes yeah. Everything, which I, I think, if, if uh, friends haven't read that, I would recommend that. Um, but it, it does uh, raise a lot of very difficult questions. I think just in response to the question around colonialism, there is certainly an argument from the countries in the global south around loss and damage, and oh, that yeah. has been diluted partly because of uh, resistance to claims for uh, reparations. Um, but, I mean, we, I don't, but they haven't, I mean, appeals for loss and damage have unfortunately have thus far been very unsuccessful. Yeah. I mean, in terms yeah. of the Paris yeah. Agreement, it was very much sort of all very soft mentions, nothing, nothing binding. Yeah, and largely because of the fear for reparations. Yeah, exactly. We've yeah. got lots of questions, so I'm going to have to, I think we're going to have to sort of rattle through them. Sorry, I'll, I'll be we, quicker. <laughs> we, well, no, I mean, it, they're all really good questions and uh, we can't really do justice to them all. Uh, there's a question, it's quite a long question, but it's essentially about uh, geoengineering. And I know you address this in your, mm -hmm. in your book. Um, and... Uh, and I think it's essentially it's a question about the sort of the, the, the ethics of geoengineering as a way out of the problem. Perhaps you could just uh, briefly say something on that point. OK, so so the short answer, there's geoengineering and there's geoengineering. So um, so essentially, you know, planting lots of trees is a kind of geoengineering in that it's a, an attempt to to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. Um, but the kind of geoengineering that people are usually talking about when they ask this question is solar radiation management. So things like sulfate injections into the stratosphere. These are hugely unproven and potentially dangerous um, te technologies, which if we start doing them, would basically commit future generations to carry on doing them. And if for any reason they couldn't because of some huge um, global upheaval, um, like a war, for example, then suddenly temperatures would fly up, as I understand it, to what they would have been otherwise. So this is really dangerous technology. There is an argument which is um, out there, which is, well, look, this is the lesser evil. This is better than, than not doing anything. But um, there's a philosopher called Stephen Gardner who's pointed out quite rightly that it's quite difficult to appeal to a lesser evil argument when the only thing that's stopping you from doing the other less evil things is that you don't particularly want to. And that is kind of the position of the world's rich at the moment. Okay, it's, again, <laughs> these are great questions that really uh, deserve a lot more time, but I'm afraid we'll have to sort of just do what we can. And we have a couple of questions that are really about action, I think. So there's a question about how do we get through to those who find climate change as something that they can't cope with, or they'd rather forget uh, uh, what's happening. And then there's a question on, could you expand on what it would mean to be a good climate activist? If I was going to start next week, what would I do? Um, good. OK, so um, motivating people. So. Catherine Hayhoe, um, the climate scientist, talks about this a lot. Um, she's really interested in it. And she talks about the need to sort of start by 
common ground with people, talk about what they already care about, find a link with that and sort of get them motivated that way. So that's that's definitely one, one aspect of it. I think another thing is that it depends who you're talking about. I mean, if we're talking about the kind of eight to 10 percent of people who are absolutely kind of ideologically, that's in the States, kind of dismissive of climate change, there's probably not a huge amount of point trying to engage with them. Um, if you're talking about people who have their heads in the sand, then it's about kind of collective psychological work to try. I mean, a lot of the way that our society is set up is to make us short term thinkers. It's kind of pushing us in the direction of ignoring these. So kind of trying to to challenge those social norms collectively and individually to try and face up to these difficult emotions and and try and move through them. And there's a huge amount of really interesting and useful climate psychology out there that I think can can help us. Um, what would be being a good climate activist? Um, well, I think obviously you can't do everything. So I think what we need to do as individuals is figure out what we can, where we most usefully fit in. So what most needs doing um, and what skills do you have? What positions of influence do you have? What money, resources, time do you have? And then think about where they both fit in. So as I, I say, I mean, there's, there's some people, you know, should be politicians, but not everyone has the skills or ability to do that. Um, some people have, you know, lots of money that they can give to NGOs, but don't have much time. Other people have more time that they can devote. Um, I do think that we do need to take seriously the need for civil disobedience at this point, given the government's um, general intransigence on this. Yes, and of course we're in a difficult situation now with the so-called energy crisis yes. and justification for further expansion of fossil fuels. Um, so I'm very conscious of time and we've got a couple of questions that I think we really should try and address. So I'm going to pick one uh, and uh, it uh, says, I was thanking you um, uh, for a fresh take on climate change, especially in the compensation part. Um, so my city was hit hard by a storm in 2011, claiming the lives of more than a thousand individuals. Gosh. I always thought to myself that tragedies such as this did not need to happen if only our government had been proactive in relocating the families from prone areas. Is this a, an example of climate injustice? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, assuming that we're talking here about the impact of the kind of extreme weather that is made worse by climate change. Yes, I mean, so climate injustice is partly to do with the way in which governments like ours are funding the fossil fuel industry to carry on making climate change worse, but it's also about failure to provide adaptation for those who, who actually need it. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the activism, uh, if governments were financially responsible for uh, causing or not responding to disasters, I think that would also perhaps shift some of the... Uh, yeah, that might that might well help. I mean, another thing that I think it's worth saying on adaptation is that there's um, the sort of participatory element is really important there as well. So often governments are kind of trying to think big picture and they're not actually listening to the communities on the ground who are suffering and who are trying to find a way of living day to day. So so governments really need to to listen to the communities that are most vulnerable and deciding how to do this. Great. I, uh, there are actually some more, I guess, personal questions directed to you. So one is uh, asking you whether you're on any government or national advisory organisations concerning climate change. Uh, then, no. <laughs> well, that was easy. Um, and then there's another question um, about the process of writing the book. Uh, how was it writing the book? Did it take a personal toll on you? Or did the deeper knowledge help you feel uh, empowered or give you hope? Both, I think. Um, it, it did take a toll. I mean, even though I've been writing and teaching the sort of philosophy of climate change for a long time, I really made a point of trying to absorb myself in the stories of, of what the, the individuals and the stories of the activists. And that, I kind of think, gave me a sort of deeper appreciation, but also, you know, it, some of it was was hard to write but at the same time I guess going back to my answer to the previous question I sort of thought well look this is something I can do I'm a writer and I think it is really important to get 
to get this message to to a global to a wider audience so yes in a way it, it did it did help me to feel to feel more hopeful and and the sort of engaging with the climate activist community always makes me feel sort of more more like there is um, there is a way forward um this is always a difficult question that uh, it follows on from that earlier one about uh, personal changes personal sacrifices you might have made uh, and how have you found making those sacrifices? Um, so I'm vegan. Um, I haven't flown for several years and generally try not to. I just went to Frankfurt from Edinburgh by train um, for a symposium. Um, and we don't have a car, but we borrow one sometimes. So um, I, I've tried to make some of the individual lifestyle changes but you know, I, I'm not not a kind of never say never. Like I would never, I wouldn't rule out ever flying if it if it was necessary, for example. And I think I've generally found it pretty positive. Um, I mean, I'm I'm also very much aware of my privilege in being able to do this because I'm in a position, you know, that we I can afford to travel by train sometimes, and I know that that's really difficult for many people. Um, that I'm able to, you know, have been able to get the ingredients and, and have the time and the ability to, to have a really, really nice vegan diet. So I'm sort of slightly hesitant in saying, oh, I've done it, it's really easy, so just everyone could do it, because I know that that's not the case for everyone. But speaking for myself, actually, those changes have all been really positive. And actually, that last point that you make uh, speaks to this uh, question we have towards the end. Um, uh, this notion that human rights can also be arbitrary. Some people may think that climate justice means economic injustice to them. Actually, I'm really, I'm really glad that someone asked that question because one thing that um, that I do talk about in the book is what we um, we call a just transition. So, um, so if if we're talking about economic justice, as in the rich being worried that they'll get less rich, I have to say that I'm not overwhelmingly concerned about that from a moral perspective. But if we are talking, which we often are talking about those people who are working really hard in the oil and gas industry, for example, um, who are already on low wages, who are really worried about their future, um, if, if that industry is, is closed, then then I think, yeah, that is a really important question. A just transition means that there is retraining, that there are renewable jobs. And so that the, the, the sort of the, the rights and interests of the people and the livelihoods of the people who are in those ind industries are also, also protected, but they can't be protected by keeping the industries going because that's a, a huge injustice to everyone else. Yes, thank you. I think that's uh, probably uh, a good note for us to, to pause. I'd rather say that we pause this conversation uh, than close it, because I think uh, you, in the book you cover so many important issues. I think the kinds of questions that we've uh, received from the audience also uh, address uh, some very challenging questions that really uh, deserve much more time and much more consideration. So I hope we have the opportunity uh, to have another conversation with you and with other uh, members of the audience uh, and to follow on from this. I hope so too. Thank you. So I'll uh, just take this opportunity to thank uh, Elizabeth very much for coming to speak to us. Um, it, I found it absolutely fascinating. I, again, I would encourage you to read the book. It's, it's, it's very accessible, but very informative, very rich. Um, and hopefully Elizabeth will be back in some form uh, for a similar kind of event and we can carry on this conversation. Uh, if you would like to purchase a copy of Elizabeth, Elizabeth's book, What Climate Justice Means and Why We Should Care, it's available from our partner bookstore, uh, bookseller, Fox Lane Books. And for more information on book sales, please see the festival website or head direct to foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival of ideas. And uh, we very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with York Festival of Ideas, please have a look at the website, yorkfestivalofideas.com for full details of all the events in the festival program. Uh, and we'd also very much appreciate your thoughts on these events and continue the conversations using the hashtag uh, York Ideas. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks for all your questions and especially thanks Elizabeth for a wonderful talk. <laughs>